All right, well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So this first session is Literacy in Literature, and it is being moderated by Simone Schloss. Good morning. This is a special pleasure for me. Um, I do love books. Uh, our speakers are rather varied, uh, but it does all fall into the category of literature. And uh, are Catherine Winters and Mackenzie von Engelhoven and Kate Nyhan. Our first speaker will be Catherine Winters. She graduated from Montclair State University with a BA in English at Simmons. She's focusing in contemporary American fiction in the College of Arts and Sciences. Following graduation next month with an MA in English, with, um, Catherine will be spending a year teaching English at the Versailles Academy in France to college and lycée, which are middle and high school students. Uh, she will be speaking this morning on repetitive shock, repeti repetitive shock, and boredom in the novel Everything is Less Than Zero by Brett Ellis, Easton Ellis. Brett Easton Ellis's novel, Less Than Zero, was published in 1985 while Ellis was an undergraduate at Bennington College. The novel was immediately a commercial success, but has long been considered of little consequence. The story chronicles Clay's return to Los Angeles after his first semester at college on the East Coast. Taking place over the course of a month, Clay and his friends spend their time going to parties, taking drugs, and eating at expensive restaurants. Despite his friends' decline into heroin addiction and male prostitution, along with a few other shocking moments, nothing seems to happen in the novel, and the tone is one of malaise and disinterest. Much, much of this is due to the extremely repetitive nature of not only the dialogue, but also the novel structure itself. Many readers will recall the phrase, people are afraid to merge, which is repeated throughout the novel, as well as several other refrains. The opening line of the book, people are afraid to merge on freeways in Los Angeles, becomes people are afraid to merge by the third time it is said on the first page, and is repeated as such throughout the book. However, while these refrains are important to the novel, they are not the only instance of repetition. Beyond just the repetition of the same activities, parties, drugs, drinking, clubs, the novel features dialogue in which the characters repeat themselves, and sentences that become lists in themselves linked by commas or conjunctions. Perhaps the most interesting, though, is at the center of the novel, in which Clay remembers last summer. In italics, which Ellis uses to denote memories of the past, Clay lists what he remembers from the summer before he went to college. The list including such things as hanging out at the clubs, the wire, nowhere club, land's end, the edge, and Rip carries a plastic eyeball in his mouth, initially seem to show that life in Los Angeles has not changed in Clay's absence. However, every item on the list, with some minor modifications, is repeated during the month that Clay is home. This suggests that the repetition in the novel is more than accidental, or even the result of bored and boring teenagers, but mindfully inserted by Ellis. Alice frequently utilizes repetition in his novels. In American Psycho, repetition is used to lull the reader into boredom. Bateman, the narrator of that novel, spends considerable time describing business cards, clothing, furniture, etc., and not just once, but regularly. Seeing that Molly Sohel posits in her essay, Repetition and the Ethics of Suspended Reading in American Psycho, that this is done so that the reader has to confront their own violent nature when they find themselves reading carefully the murder and mutilation that Bateman commits. While the repetition in Lesson Zero is similar in many ways, there is little violence in this novel to confront. Additionally, unlike Bateman, Clay does not commit the violence that does occur. He is only a witness as the reader is. The aim of this paper is to explore the repetition and discuss the effect of the novel to better understand its purpose. I will be focusing on phrases I call the frames, and their emotion, emotional context, and how they help us to understand the action of the novel. There are three refrains in the novel, occurring with varying amounts of frequency. Disappear here, wonder if he's for sale, and people are afraid to merge. These all appear at different points in the novel as part of the regular action or dialogue. However, for some reason, these stick with Clay. As the end of the novel suggests, we can assume that Clay is relating this tale after his return to his college in New Hampshire, some length of time after his visit home. 
The repetition is mindfully is inserted by the narrator at times when the initial meaning comes to mind. For example, quote, I sit on a bench and wait for them, staring out at the expanded sand that meets the water where the land ends. Disappear here. Unquote. Recall the emotion of, quote, I see a billboard that I don't remember seeing and I look up at it. All it says is disappear here. And even though it's probably an ad for some resort, it still freaks me out a little and I step on the gas really hard and the car screeches as I leave the light, end quote. These are analepsis, which the Bedford Glossary of Critical and Literary Terms defines as the evocation in a narrative of scenes or events that took place at an earlier point in the story. These disrupt the flow of the narrative to recall the scene in which they first appear. This literary technique calls off the reader to go back to the origin and compare the uses of the phrases. And as it continues through the novel, weight is added to the phrase to convey more meaning. I believe Ellis is using analepsis as lines that Clay, as the narrator, says rather than explaining his emotions in the novel. <coughs> Some have suggested that these refrains are present in the book as part of its pop aesthetic, often classified as a teenage novel, or from USA Today, Catcher in the Rye for the MTV generation, Critics see music culture as influencing Ellis's novel. However, by relegating these phrases to being just refrains, like songs just have choruses, is to say they are present in the book simply to remind the readers of the music they enjoy. This is problematic for a number of reasons, not the least of which is the highbrow idea that popular music lacks meaning. The novel does feature two epigraphs from popular music, features lines from songs throughout, and the title of the novel itself comes from an El Elvis Costello song. These references to songs also serve to further the unsaid emotions, coloring the scenes in which they appear. While it is true that Ellis looks to music in many ways, these refrains become a kind of emotional shorthand. The content of the scenes surrounding each refrain informs the reader of the meaning that each phrase takes on, and then we see how these emotions are carried with the phrase in each usage. Perhaps the most memorable phrase repeated in the novel, People Are Afraid to Merge, is an avoidance. The opening line from the novel is the first thing I hear when I come back to the city. Blair, Clay's high school girlfriend, says this to him upon picking him up. Rather than welcoming him back, asking about his trip, or talking about the possible eating disorder of their mutual friend. As Clay says, nothing else seems to matter, not the fact that I'm 18 and it's December and the ride on the plane had been rough. It seems easier to hear that people are afraid to merge than I'm pretty sure Muriel is anorexic. Nothing else seems to matter to me but those 10 words. Not the warm winds which seem to propel the car down the empty asphalt freeway or the faded smell of marijuana. Immediately, we are gre greeted by Clay's apathy, much as he is greeted with people are afraid to merge by Blair. This phrase becomes avoidance and disinterest because the two don't talk of anything of consequence, which means Clay begins to feel that nothing matters. People are afraid to merge is also exactly what it sounds like. Said by Clay's former girlfriend, it signifies their inability to communicate and be in a relationship. The two struggle to have any meaningful conversation throughout the new book, and therefore can't combine to be one couple. Blair is commenting on society, but also her situation with Clay. Just as people can't merge on the freeway, she and Clay are afraid to merge in life. Three pages later, Clay repeats the phrase, I can still hear people are afraid to merge. Having returned to his parents' house, Clay finds no one home reaching his room, which has been clean but somehow remains unchanged. He finds a message from his friend Julian. Attempting to call him back, he gets no answer. Later, waiting for his friends at a restaurant, Clay again repeats the phrase to himself, quote, The man keeps staring at me, and all I can think is either he doesn't see me or I'm not here. I don't know why I think that. People are afraid to merge. Again, we see a disconnection from people, whether it is the absent, fam absent family, the lack of answer, or the stranger staring past him. Clay is also disinterested in the state of these things. He is not even interested in why he wonders if he isn't real. Importantly, just as the phrase was first used to avoid meaningful conversation, each subsequent use reflects Clay's avoidance of emotion. Just as Clay and Blair can't connect, Clay has trouble connecting to his own emotions, apparent in his apathy, and this phrase reflects that as well. This appear here is most related to Clay's fears. Having returned to Los Angeles, Clay is afraid he will disappear here and not go back to New Hampshire, get lost in the crowd, or perhaps even survive. Quote, I asked the film student, didn't it bother you the way they kept dropping characters out of the film for no reason? The film student pauses and says, kind of, but that happens in real life. No one would notice if Clay disappeared because he's unable to merge with anyone. 
Though unable to say it, Clay is afraid, and especially afraid of staying in Los Angeles. As he says at the end of the novel, in reference to the images, he associated with a title, song titled Los Angeles. Quote, the images I had were of people being driven mad by living in the city. Images of parents who were so hungry and unfulfilled they ate their own children. Images of people, teenagers my own age, looking up from the asphalt and being blinded by the sun. Clay is freaked out by the idea of despairing in Los Angeles as he, as the billboard, quote, freaks him out a little when he first sees it. I wonder if he's for sale, is said by one of Clay's younger <coughs> sisters, who are indistinguishable and unnamed. Said jokingly, it suggests the ideas of people as commodity. Clay is uncomfortable about this comment, but this refrain links more to ideas than emotions. I wonder if he's for sale, suggests a casual use of the body, whether that is the hook of culture of LA youth that Clay engages in, or prostitution. The only time all three refrains are said together also includes the phrase, you're a beautiful boy, and that's all that matters. Set off in italics, and therefore marked as a memory rather than a frame. This is said first by Mr. Erickson, a man from Indiana who paid to have sex with Julian while Clay watched. This sentence initially seems more benign, simply a suggestion that appearance can help someone through life in LA. However, the context that it is set in is much worse than the refrain, which becomes to mean much the same thing. In this case, Ellis might be engaging in prolapses in which Clay narrating the story, the story, this story after leaving, he chooses this phrase, though the event that makes it most meaningful has yet to happen. This differs from analepsis, because in this case, the reader is not recalling the first scene to understand the second, but to recontextualize the first and understand why these words become important to Clay in the future. <coughs> this also explains the use of the phrase between its initial utterance and the scene with Mr. Erickson, which takes its weight not from a flippant comment from his sister, but the sale of his childhood friend's body. As the narration lists the three refrains along with You're a Beautiful Boy, we are also told the syringe fills with blood. Initially, I thought this was another refrain, because when Muriel shoots heroin at a party, Clay recalls, the syringe slowly fills with blood. However, the scene in which Clay says it a second time is while Julian's pinned is drugging him with heroin and the syringe flows with blood is part of the action of the current scene. While repeated almost verbatim a hundred pages apart, this again has no emotional context. Rather, this recalls the first shocking thing that Clay saw upon his return to LA, and I would suggest that this is again prolapsis rather than analepsis. Clay does not remember <coughs> the syringe fills with blood because he is recalling Muriel when he watches Julian, but because in writing it, he recalled Julian when he sees Muriel. I suggest this because while Muriel is taking, taking heroin is different from all of the other drugs, drug use pervading the novel because it is a harder drug, it is initially not seen as particularly spectacular. Watching Muriel choose to use this drug as opposed to the other drugs is in many ways the same as what the other characters do. And it does not seem special or dangerous. But in the presence, but with the presence of several voyeurs, including Clay and a photographer, it's marked as the start of watching the more awful acts that will come. This brings us to the scenes that Clay has been confronted with in the novel. The first is Muriel's heroin use, in which five people watch her inject herself during a party. Clay stays to watch this and says another friend's, quote, lips are trembling and she looks excited and I can make out the beginnings of a smile. Here we begin to see Clay's friend group moving into more dangerous territory, whether through action or, or voyeurism. Later, at a party in Malibu, Clay is shown a snuff film. This is purely voyeurism, but excites many, including Clay's college friend, Daniel. <coughs> the reader is not told much about this film as Clay leaves the room. These are both instances where Clay is only asked to watch. It is unclear exactly how these situations make Clay feel. We know his hands shake as Muriel shoots heroin, and that he needs to calm down after walking out of the snuff film, but that is all. Notably, neither of these scenes feature the refrains as if they are devoid of emotional content. Realizing that all that does matter is that I want to see the worst. In 18 pages, Clay witnesses Julian's prostitution and pimp feeding him drugs, a dead body outside a club, and the rape of a young girl. The climax of these scenes is when Julian is paid to watch. Clay is paid to watch Julian have sex with an older man and then witnesses Julian attempt to leave his pimp. It is at this point that the, all three refrains come into play. Quote, what are you gonna do? You have nowhere to go. 
you're going to tell everyone that you forged yourself off to pay a drug debt? Man, you're more naive than I thought. But come on, baby, you'll feel better. Disappear here. The syringe fills with blood. You're a beautiful boy, and that's all that matters. Wonder if he's for sale. People are afraid to merge. To merge. And hope. At this point, Clay has seen the worst, but he's not yet determined to leave LA. He has the avoidance, disconnection, fear, and memories of what he's seen reverberate in his mind. Clay is then taken to see the body and the young girl, pushing him to decide. In each case, Clay watches, either taking part or stopping anything. But now he is no longer distanced from the event. He could stop any of these events, and instead, the closest he comes is when a young girl has been bound and gagged and is being raped by the drug All he says is, I don't think it's right. Having seen the worst, and then some, Clay is forced to decide whether he's staying leaving or leaving, and Clay chooses to leave. Quote, I close the door behind me. In isolation, isolation, these events are horrific. However, in the context of the novel, they become almost unremarkable as the reader reacts as Clay does. Having normalized things that are generally considered wrong outside of this world, such as casual sex and drug use, Clay must see the worst to be surprised. I don't know if these instances can be considered shocking or surprising for Clay. Ultimately, they seem unappealing. Clay at no point reacts in terror, but simply mildly objects and leaves, finding no joy in these acts. However, if we keep in mind the original scenes of these three refrains, we begin to see how deeply affected Clay truly is and how his intense emotions push him to leave the city behind. In American Psycho, the reader is shown excessive violence and finds themselves savoring the detailed description because of the fast-paced writing in these sections compared to the rest of the novel. In Less Than Zero, the reader is not asked to savor these moments of extreme violence because Clay does not find enjoyment of in them. While his friends find it exciting or arousing to watch a snuff film, rape a girl, or look at a dead body, Clay finds these uninteresting at best and objectionable at worst. At no point does Clay make a call to police or even object very strongly. Nothing seems to matter to Clay, and he can't bring himself to react strongly to any of these scenes. However, by the end of the novel, Clay is not completely numb to these events. Additionally, the writing for these scenes of violence versus the in-depth description is very different in American Psycho, whereas it does not differ as much in Lesson Zero. The shocking scenes are less repetitive, but they are not any more fast-paced and still features the dialogue if that is at least boring, if not repetitive. The malaise that surrounds the novel makes it hard for Clay to openly express his emotions, but the refrains give the reader's clues as to how to interpret his thoughts at these times. Clay is confronting nothingness in this novel, in But This Road Doesn't Go Anywhere, The Existential Dilemma in Less Than Zero. Nikki Salen writes, the problem with nothingness for Clay is that it is simultaneously fascinating and horrifying, seductive and repulsive. The nothing that Clay is confronting is apathy, disconnected from emotion and surrounded by people who use drugs, despite the fact that it is always a bad trip and who are bored by the same activities, but can never seem to come up with new ideas. It is inevitable that at some point they will push the boundaries to attempt to feel something. Clay confronts the nothingness, but he does not find that everything that happens matters, as Salen suggests. Rather, he becomes more apathetic to life. After a month in LA, Clay comes to the conclusion that, quote, nothing makes me happy. However, following this up with, quote, if I care about things, it will be worse. It'll be another thing to worry about. It is Clay's own distance, his own inability to merge that is keeping him from happiness. This is essentially different from an existential epiphany because he does not assume any sort of responsibility for the acts he saw, nor were any of them committed of his own free will. Clay does not prostitute himself to pay for his drug debts. Rather, he just, he watches a friend do it. Clay does not question his knowledge of right and wrong. He just avoids caring because he is afraid of intense emotion. And so he distances himself from everything he can possibly care about to avoid <coughs> anger and happiness. The repetitiveness of the novel is a tool used to keep these emotions at bay. Their brains avoid talking about emotions. Their repetitive activities maintain the same reactions. The dialogue with the same phrases allows no real meaning to be conveyed. And while all the characters are apathetic, they begin to do shocking things in an attempt to shock themselves, to see the worst. Whether unable or unwilling to be shocked by what he has seen, Clay leaves LA. 
further distancing himself from the chance of feeling anything. The whole novel is not as simple as this. Lesson Zero is certainly not a happy story in which Clay learns that he needs to open his heart to be fulfilled as a person. However, it becomes easier to understand the emotional content and the emotional journey that Clay does go through, despite seeming utterly apathetic throughout by looking for refrains. Repetition is essential to understanding this novel. In some ways, that is the project of the novel, as it seems to swirl in on itself and end in much the same place it begins. Ellis does attempt to shock the reader. These events certainly would be shocking in real life. However, Ellis simultaneously strives to distance the river, reader emotionally. This novel pushes the reader not to confront their violence or their willingness to witness atrocities. Clay does not relish in these scenes, and Ellis does not ask the reader to, <coughs> but rather to reach the epitome of apathy, but also understand the emotional depth of the characters. Though seemingly flat, this novel is more complicated than it initially seems, as much of Ellis's work can be. questions until all three speakers have presented the commonalities and interesting points that we can connect, so I think that's the best way to use our discussion time. Mackenzie von Englenhoven graduated with a BA in History from Utah State University. As Simmons, she's earning her MFA in Writing for Children and Young Adults. I discovered a special bond with Mackenzie when I learned that she too was a non-reader during high school and college. I turned to math. Uh, for Mackenzie, it was rediscovering children's books that made her fall in love with books again. Her short fiction for children and teens has been published in The Friend, In Accurate Realities, uh, The Newport Review, and other publications. She's also the recipient of the 2014 Penn New England Susan P. Bloom Discovery Award for Emerging Children's Book Writers. Usually, you can find her reading, but this morning she'll be speaking. She's speaking on the anxiety of technological progress in young adult literature, and her work is entitled We Enter a Time of Calamity. Hi, hey, everyone. Uh, so, like she said, I'm Mackenzie. My paper is called We Enter a Time of Calamity The Anxiety of Technological Progress in Children's and Young Adult Literature. Also, I talk really fast, so if I get cruising, somebody wave at me to slow me down, please. In 1903, author George Gissing wrote, quote, I hate and fear science because of my conviction that for a long time to come, if not forever, it will be the remorseless enemy of mankind. I see it destroying all simplicity and gentleness of life, all beauty of the world. I see it restoring barbarism under the mask of civilization. I see it darkening men's minds and hardening their hearts, end quote. Anxiety over progress is a familiar idea that has existed throughout time. As the world changes and technology evolves, generation after generation shares Gissing's fears of this plunge into the unknown and what it means for society and humanity. Progression inspires fear for the world to come. In recent years, with the rapid development of information and communication technology, children's literature has begun to use this anxiety to create dynamic but close-to-home worlds in which their characters fight against progress and technology. Many recent young adult novels, written by a generation that grew up without today's technologies for a generation that is defined by them, project anxiety over recent technological advances and the information overload that accompanies it. I believe this constant anxiety, which appears in books such as The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins, Man Made Boy by John Scavron, and Feed by M.T. Anderson, can be alienating to young readers who are tired of hearing that the world they are growing up in and their means of communicating are damaging them, and is missing its target audience by catering to the worldviews of its writers instead of its readers. Literature has always been a vehicle for expressing and exploring anxiety, and the natural human fear of change and the unknown is often present. Children's literature is no exception. Many classic examples utilize this progression anxiety to create conflict and empathy within their storyline. In The Velveteen Rabbit by Marjorie Williams, an old-style stuffed rabbit is cast away on Christmas morning in favor of newer and sleeker mechanical toys, thus inspiring children everywhere to cling to their old stuffed toys until they are coming apart at the seams. The book was an exercise in guilt over the rejection of a familiar traditional toy in favor of a new one, rather than accepting that this is a natural part of childhood and growing up. We see this similarly in Mike Mulligan and His Steam Shovel by Virginia Lee Burton. Laborer Mike Mulligan and his steam shovel Mary Ann, Mary Ann helped dig everything from skyscraper foundations to airports, making them essential to their community. But, quote, then came along the new gasoline shovels and the new electric shovels and the new diesel motor shovels and took all the jobs away from the steam shovels, end quote. 
Mike Mulligan and Marianne are replaced by newer and more efficient technology, a natural part of life, but the book is set up so that the reader sympathizes with Mike Mulligan and Mary Ann rather than the new diesel, electric, and gasoline shovels, which are illustrated with their heads high in the air and smug looks on their faces, in contrast to the smiling and cheerful looking Mary Ann. Burton tells us that the appearance of these new machines made, quote, Mike Mulligan and Mary Ann very sad. Because we sympathize with our hero and his outdated technology, the reader is positioned to view technological progress as antagonistic. This progression anxiety is carried beyond picture books and into books for older readers. It has also become more focused with the new rapid technological developments of the last 20 years, especially as technology, as technology has become an even more integral part of the teenage experience. While teenagers are usually the most plugged into new technology and most willing to embrace it, authors and publishers are continually feeding them books that warn them about the dangers of this rather than encouraging them to make use of it. This may be due in part to what folklorist Mark Pretzky calls the divide between digital immigrants and digital natives. While consumers of these novels, primarily teens, are digital natives who have grown up on familiar terms with today's technology, the authors writing these books, as well as, as the publishers, are digital immigrants who grew up without it and are now having to navigate it and adapt to changes that it, that it has brought to society. These digital immigrants are more likely to be wary of this progression and its corrupting effects because it is new and unfamiliar to them. This anxiety then transfers into the novels they are creating. Their novels become tools for warning the youth against the corrupting powers of technology, the literary equivalent of telling kids to get out from behind the television and go play outside. Noga Applebaum writes that, quote, despite the obvious opportunities for personal and social development which technology offers young people, adults often view it as a threat to children's innocence, end quote. Parents, authors, and publishers, wary of this untested tech on their impressionable youths, have made it the easy villain for many contemporary young adult speculative fiction texts. One of the most popular, popular novels, young adult or otherwise, in recent years is The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. This novel presents a picture of post-apocalyptic America, now called Pan Am, in which most of the population suffers in extreme poverty and has access to little technology. They are reduced to hunting with bows and arrows and powering their electric motors with coal, while a small section of the population living in the capital revels in opulence, including advanced futuristic technology. This technological gap is, one of the, gap is one of the way Collins shows the divide between the capital and Katniss's impoverished home in District 12. It also seems no coincidence that the technolo technologically advanced areas of Pan Am produce two main types of characters, antagonists or insipid airheads. The fiercest tributes, including Katniss's last enemy in the, re the arena, the bloodthirsty Cato, are from districts close enough to the capital to give, access to, to give them access to technological advances. Cato does not see the grim irony of the Hunger Games and has no mercy or desire to subvert the system. Instead, he is fueled by a desire to win by any means necessary. Two more of the novel's antagonists, the tyrannical dictator President Snow and Seneca Crane, the head game maker responsible for the deadly arena, are similar products of the capital and its technology. The capital citizens who are not primary antagonists are portrayed with a certain degree of thoughtlessness that is born from their privileged lives. Effie, Katniss and Peeta's capital-born guide for the games, is image-obsessed, vapid, and stupid. Quote, well, if you put enough pressure on it, coal turns into pearls. Effie beams at us so brilliantly that we have no choice but to respond enthusiastically to her cleverness, even though it's wrong, end quote. The divide is clear. The heroes like Katniss, Peeta, and Rue rise from Pan Am's technologically stunted districts, while the antagonists and least savory characters come from the capital. The corruption and insipidness rampant in the capital can be viewed as a direct result of the effects of technology and the withholding of it from the rest of the world. Technology has corrupted the citizens of the capital so that they turn the blind eye to the suffering and inequality in the rest of Pan Am. Quote, while the good guys struggle to survive, the bad guys employ fictional gee whiz technologies inspired, inspired by real life frontiers, end quote. Katniss's bow and arrow against the capital's death bringing cover crafts and electric force fields provide a sharp contrast between the good guy and the bad guys and further emphasize the David and Goliath elements of the story. Quote, uneven technological development is a staple of science fiction because it implies a society and a government that has lost its way or has mistaken priorities and as a result unjustly divides technological resources or uses those resources to control the populace in inappropriate ways, end quote. The technology in the capital also is also used in a way that sharply contrasts it with life in the other districts. While Katniss has to illegally poach game to feed her family, the people of the capital are spending their money on extravagant outfits and dyeing their skin and hair pastel colors. Quote, they do surgery in the capital to make people appear younger and thinner. Wrinkles aren't desirable. A round belly isn't a sign of success, end quote. The technology is also being used to help Katniss and others pick out food and clothing more efficiently. Quote, I program the closet for an outfit to my taste. The windows zoom in and out on parts of the city at my command. 
You need only whisper a type of food from a gigantic menu into a mouthpiece, and it appears hot and steamy before you in less than a minute." End quote. This all in contrast to Katniss's home in District 12 shows that the capital has been corrupted and made shallow by the technology it possesses. While the bad guys live with bullet trains and computerized wardrobes, the heroes rise from a traditional good old days lifestyle that values hard work above progress. Once Katniss gets inside the games themselves, the capital's technology is used to create an environment in which nearly everything is trying to kill everyone in it, resulting in constant mortal peril. Technology becomes the object of oppression for the Hunger Games contestants and a literal antagonist. The fact that the games are broadcast on, a tele on television across a world that is operating under essentially a media blackout, cell phones and internet are both noticeably absent from Pan Am, further emphasize the evil use of technology in this world. The only form of mass communication that exists is used to broadcast children killing each other, not a strong case for technology bettering its population. This technology is also used to create constant surveillance over the players, harkening back to an Orwellian anxiety over the loss of privacy that is sharpened by the use of new technology to achieve it. With an estimated 30 million surveillance cameras in the United States today, this takes a real-life fear and elevates it to a new extreme. Before Katniss enters the games, she's injected with a tracker so that, quote, the game makers will always be able to trace my whereabouts in the arena, end quote. The technology employed by the Capitol in the creation and execution of the Hunger Games is used to track and kill the competitors one by one. In a technology-fueled environment, children lose focus on everything but survival, even if that survival means killing others. Another young adult novel that explores anxiety over technological progress is Man Made Boy by John Scabron. The novel is an updated retelling of one of the most enduring stories of science and technology gone out of control, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. The subtitle to Shelley's novel is, quote, The Modern Prometheus, implying that she saw her novel as an adaptation of the Prometheus myth, which details the creation of man from clay, from clay, excuse me. But rather than exploring the creation of man by an omniscient god, Shelley imagined a man created by another man, thus blurring the lines between God and man. Her story questioned the morality of this scientific advance and the lengths to which science could or should be taken. It also reflected the enlightenment fears of her time and anxiety over a movement away from God and religion in favor of science. In Man Made Boy, Scavron updates Shelley's novel for the 21st century and adapts it for a young adult audience. Man Made Boy similarly tells a creation myth that reflects the anxieties of its age, but a computer program takes the place of Frankenstein's creature. The novel centers around Boy, the son of Frankenstein's monster and the bride living in present-day New York City. He creates a computer virus called Vi that then he loses control of in the same way Victor Frankenstein created and then lost control of his creature. Much like the creature, Vi seeks out attention from her creator as a cure for her isolation. In the process, Vi hacks and destro destroys other computers, takes over human brains rendering them mindless puppets, and even kills several people, all seemingly without remorse, in contrast to Victor Frankenstein's creature who, quote, lamented the fall after each of his cruel actions. Gavron's adaptation of Frankenstein for the 21st century has moved beyond the creation of a physical man and ex explores instead our anxiety over losing control of our virtual creations, echoing the sentiments of Shelley's monster, quote, you are my creator, but I am your master, obey. Man-made boy explores the fear of what we are creating using technology. Can virtual creations be as destructive as Frankenstein's physical monster? Do we truly have control over our virtual creations? Boy certainly doesn't know. Gavron provides no answers for these questions, but his novel projects an anxiety of someday losing control of and then suffering at the hands of our advanced technology. In the end of Man Made Boy, Vi is stopped when she is forced to process Boy's humans emo human emotions, something she as a, program, a computer program is incapable of doing. Quote, Vi was trying to process the massive amount of data I had just pushed through her. I had taken the hours of fears, doubts, regrets, anger, pain, and sorrow that I felt, compressed them, and shoved them down her throat. I knew there was no way she could handle it all. The sheer volume of analog experience was too much for her digital mind to process." End quote. Using a uniquely and defining human experience, feeling emotion, to stop the computer program antagonist, Scavon privileges humans over technology. Even though the emotions Boy describes are undesirable, doubt, fear, regret, anger, etc., he is capable of feeling something his computer program Vi is not, and that gives him an advantage over her. Scavron's novel presents the idea that we as humans will always be superior to any digital counterpart we might create, even self-sufficient ones like Vi, because we have feelings, which he positions as superior to Vi's programming. Feed by M.T. Anderson takes the idea of destructive digital technology one step further by bridging the gap between man and computer. In the world of Feed, nearly all people have a computer implanted inside their brain at a young age. That computer, called the Feed, projects chat, television, shopping recommendations, and general consumerism directly into their subconsciousness. Quote, the braggest thing about the feed, the thing that made it really big, is that it knows everything you want and hope for, sometimes before you even know what those things are. 
It can tell you how to get them and help you make buying decisions that are hard, end quote. The feed has removed screens and cables from our computers so that humans themselves have become inseparable from the technology that rules their, word, their world. End quote, human subjectivity is erased and the identity of the consumer is, only avail is the only available space to occupy. Like many young adult literature authors, Anderson explores the destructive effects of progress, end quote. At the beginning of the novel, Titus and his friends are the victims of a hacker that shuts down their feeds and leaves the not so subtle message, we enter a time of calamity. They experience several days of being unplugged for the first time since they were children. Titus's sentiments on those days echo those of parents who tell their children to turn off the computer and go outside. The section of the novel is titled Eden, implying that once unplugged from their technology, Titus and his friends experience something close to paradise. Though at first the teens are bored and lost without their feeds, they invent games and forms of entertainment. Violet, Titus' girlfriend, says to him, this is fun, and he replies, it weirdly is. It is during these feedless days that Violet and Titus begin their relationship and share their first kiss. Without his feed, when he is near Violet, Titus thinks, quote, I feel really connected. This is an intentional play on the idea of being connected, which is the object of having a feed, but it's not until his is gone that Titus feels a true emotional connection to his new girlfriend. The feed in his brain has kept him from seeing the world or experiencing a real connection with those around him. When his feed is down, he starts to develop a sincere and meaningful relationship with Violet. However, once the feeds are returned, Titus immediately reverts back to his total reliance upon it. Titus himself is a shallow and self-absorbed narrator who speaks in run-on sentences chock full of slang reminiscent of both Newspeak in 1984 and the text chat and abbreviations that have become widespread today. Though the connection between the feed and the slang is never directly drawn, it can be assumed that much of the abbreviations and poor grammar are a result. This preys upon today's common adage that technology, particularly texting, is destroying communication rather than viewing it as a natural evolution of language. Titus is presented as an unreliable and unlikable narrator and does not readily invite reader identification. He sees evil and hears evil and sometimes speaks evil but does nothing at all to arrest it. Though Titus recognizes the guilt he should feel over his reliance on the feed, he refuses to feel it. Quote, everyone feels bad about that, but they're the only way to get stuck. And it's not good getting pissy about it because they're still going to control everything whether you like it or not, end quote. Titus, a representation of an average young male in his society, is apathetic, unsympathetic, and shallow. As a product of society and the technology that defines it, he isn't much to look forward or hope for. In contrast, Titus' girlfriend Violet is set up as the novel's main sympathetic character. She personifies values that many adults praise in today's youth. She speaks almost slang free, feels empathy for others, and she alone seems aware of the option to and willingness to fight against the feed. She takes Titus to the mall with her and makes as many random purchases as possible in an attempt to, to try and confuse the feed so that it is unable to tap into their wants as effectively as before. She is fighting against the technology that rules her world and consciousness because she recognizes that it can be a force for evil. However, Violet's attempts to break free from this backfires. As a result of the hack, her feed begins shutting down her body and brain, and she cannot get assistance in, um, sorry, she cannot get assistance in ratifying this because the feed tech, the corporation that manages the feeds, cannot create a comprehensive consumer profile on her as a result of her attempts to confuse it. They rule her dispensable because she is not a rational consumer. Violet's attempts to break free of technology results in the literal shutdown of her body with no one willing to help. The novel's only subversive character is destroyed by the technology that lives inside her. Much like Vi in Man Made Boy and the technology within the Hunger Games, the feed can become literally destructive instead of just damaging to our morals and standards. Anderson himself wrote about his inspiration behind feed, quote, advertising and information has become even more intense and not just for teens, now that most of us are connected all the time through devices of one kind or another. People have told me that feed is coming true. Some of the technologies I discussed have been explored in recent years, but in a sense, I believe it was already a reality when I began writing, end quote. Anderson wrote Feed in 2001, before most of the devices that it most clearly resembles were prevalent. As the book is largely satirical, he was both providing commentary on the current state of the world and also looking ahead to a possible future of where we could end up if we continued on our current path. Anderson has said that, quote, already my dreams of who I wanted to be, my understanding of who I had been in the past, my hopes for who I'd become in the future, these things had already been influenced and perhaps even constructed by advertising images, movie stills, and primetime TV, end quote. He is suggesting that citizens of today's digital world are created by the ever-present media stream that has appeared in the last 20 years, most of it as a, result of as a direct result of technological progress. Children's literature is perhaps the only genre of fiction where the primary audience is not the same as the creators. Children do not write children's books. Instead, these books are created by adults who inevitably inflict some of their biases and worldviews into them. Because of the generational gap defined by Krensky as the digital native and digital immigrant, 
Much of this anxiety is centered around technological advances, particularly in today's rapidly changing environment. These anxieties then reflect back into the books that are being created, as we see in The Hunger Games, Feed, and Man Made Boy. Can adults truly create books for children and young adults if they keep using them as platforms to warn against the dangers of the world children are growing up in? Children and young adults don't want to be bombarded by messages about the corrupting power of the omnipresent technology they use every day. The disconnect between author and audience is important to recognize in both writing and reading books for children and young adults, and it can be damaging to warn against technological progress when today's young people have no choice but to use it. There is no right or wrong answer to the question of technological progress, simply old and new, and it is important for authors and publishers to recognize this in order to create books with which today's youth can relate. Thank you. Thank you, Mackenzie. It's interesting to hear about two authors who are concerned with connecting and disconnecting from their audiences. Kate Nyhan is uh, a candidate at Simmons for a degree in LIS, and she teaches English as a second language. After graduating from Harvard, she worked in Belgium and South Korea. Her interest in research is centered on instructional design and technology, faculty, staff collaboration, information literacy, and its assessment. She's active in Simmons Assist, Assist. 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 and she's a liaison to NE Assist. She is also, I can report firsthand, an excellent reference librarian at Beatley Library on Monday and Friday nights. So we both spend lots of time. So Kate will be speaking on current practices, best and worst practices in information literacy vis-a-vis -vis international students. You guys are all invited to come to Beaton Library <laughs> anytime, but especially Monday and Friday nights. <coughs> uh, I'd like to say a, a thank you to, to quite a few people who've helped me put this, this project together so far. Uh, Professor Saunders uh, helped me plan this research at a really early stage. Um, Valerie Boudreau from the Simmons IRB. Um, they're not as frightening as you think, really. Um, all the, the people who have given me their opinions and told me about their experience, um, Simone and, and the rest of the panelists, um, everyone who organized the, the symposium, especially Giselle, who had to respond to some uh, frantic emails from me now and then. Uh, so thanks to everyone who has been involved. <coughs> I'm really pleased to be part of this panel in particular with its interdisciplinary nature um, because my paper draws not only on the literature of information literacy as, as discussed by academic librarians, uh, but also my profession as a teacher of English to adults who are planning to earn undergraduate or graduate degrees at American universities. Uh, the information that I'll be sharing with you today, it comes from instructors and from university-based support staff uh, who work with international students, as well as from the library literature and documents describing library policies and procedures. Now, those of you who teach, or those of you who work in academic libraries, have probably heard something like this before. I found some of the ideas from the articles I read. I can say, I just shared those ideas. Therefore, when I first did the literature review, I deliberately did not use in-text reference because I thought that happened to be my idea. Why do I have to cite him or her? Otherwise, I am a plagiarist? Plus, in Chinese scholarly writing, we cite in a different way. A lot of journals accept non-in-text citations which means you don't have to acknowledge the author in the text if you didn't use direct quotes. Plus, I felt embarrassed that everything I read had to be cited in the text. That would be like telling the reader that nothing is out of me. Another thing that confused me was that most of the times I found that the author has the perfectly described or argued for or against an idea, and I don't have the ability to paraphrase it better. So I leave it as direct quote. Yeah, that is a direct quote uh, from a Chinese PhD student in Australia. 
um, in the 2008-2009 academic year, so in a similar uh, sort of technological era. Uh, this is a woman who already had a graduate degree, earned in China, um, and already had a successful career teaching English in an academic environment at a Chinese university. Uh, this quotation comes from research by Jing Han at the Center for Educational Research at the University of Western Sydney. Um, she uses a technique of biographical narratives in which students are invited to reflect on their life and study experiences repeatedly for more than a year. You have probably heard similar things uh, from your students. I know that mine express similar sentiments all the time. Um, now, this does not represent, or at least it does not necessarily represent, a moral failing by the student who has committed plagiarism. Instead, it shows a failure on the part of librarians and instructors to educate students about the standards of academic honesty expected at our institutions. Plagiarism is just one of many areas where researchers have recognized that students, local and international, lack essential understanding uh, <clears throat> of their responsibilities as participants in our grand academic project of intellectual inquiry. Librarians have, uh, thankfully, articulated standards for information literacy to identify the skills that students should have that is, the skills that we as librarians and instructors should be helping students to build. Um, the, uh, although the Association of College and Research Libraries Information Literacy Competency Standards for Higher Education are currently being extensively revised, uh, they, and as well the discipline-specific standards that you can find on the ACRL website, they're an important resource for faculty and for instructional designers, as well as for librarians. According to various professional organizations, information literacy is a set of abilities requiring individuals to recognize when information is needed and have the ability to locate, evaluate, and use effectively the needed information. Thus, information literate individuals can determine the extent of information needed, access the needed information effectively and efficiently, evaluate information and its sources critically, incorporate selected information into their knowledge base, use information effectively to accomplish a specific purpose, and understand the economic, legal, and social issues surrounding the use of information and access and use information ethically and legally. That's where our plagiarism comes in again. Now, these abilities are valuable and, and necessary in academia, but also in business and in private life. And these abilities don't just happen. They can be developed and improved. It's especially important for us to recognize that capability of improvement because many of us who work in academia now are the product of a sort of sink or swim academic culture in which college students are expected to develop research skills largely on their own. Um, and you know what? That approach works to an extent. Some students do develop research skills without formal instruction. Um, they usually reinvent the wheel through a, a process of trial and error and they can achieve, in the end, a greater or lesser degrees of proficiency in research. Eventually, these students who swam, they become instructors. And they sometimes retain this assumption that, well, if I had to figure out anything from first principles without formal instruction, then everybody else can and should do the same thing. You can probably tell I disagree. <laughs> Now, of course, there is middle ground, right? Figuring things out rather than blindly following the steps of some established method, that's an important part of learning. Uh, indeed, the ACRL standards uh, explicitly discuss the process whereby students can become more self-directed and assume greater control over their own learning. Um, that's a goal shared by instructors, librarians, instructional designers, instructional technologists, everyone who's working together in this project. 
Um, speaking of instructors in particular, research shows that faculty members value information literacy. Um, in the words of Eleonora Dubisky, who studied faculty perceptions of students' information literacy skills competencies, faculty at both two-year and four-year colleges are, quote, overwhelmingly supportive of information literacy and are incorporating these skills into learning outcomes for their courses. Research also shows that faculty articulate expectations for their students, uh, that they will have or will develop skills included in the concept of information literacy, even if that particular phrase, which is kind of property of the librarians, even if that particular phrase is not used. For example, in a study of the reading and writing expectations of matriculated university students, um, Neil Anderson and others found that professors expect students to apply new knowledge, engage in critical thinking, synthesize information, develop, uh, demonstrate knowledge through writing, be strategic readers, synthesize knowledge, clarify thoughts, communicate effectively, and evaluate others' work. Pretty reminiscent of the ACRL standards, right? Even though they don't call it information literacy. In that <coughs> um, note, however, that the professors whom Anderson surveyed, they also identified aspects of information literacy, without that name, as challenges that block or at least delay the progress of their students. Uh, they point out strategic reading and critical thinking as prominent challenges. So clearly, faculty value information literacy whether or not they use that name for it. However, information literacy instruction is not always effectively integrated into the student experience at the level of institutions, at the level of departments, and even at the level of individual classes. In particular, one particular subgroup of students needs to receive more and better attention in terms of information literacy needs and instruction. And that subgroup is international students who are studying at American universities. International students are becoming more and more significant in American higher education. According to the 2013 Open Doors Report from the International Education Exchange, uh, the 2012-13 academic year saw more than 800,000 international students studying at United States colleges and universities. That's an increase of more than 40% over a decade. Uh, here in Massachusetts, we had almost 50,000 of those international students, so we're punching above our weight. Um, in addition to the many benefits that I'm sure you recognize from your own experience international students bring, uh, in terms of intellectual talent and diversity, there are also financial benefits. The Department of Commerce has calculated that international students contribute more than $24 billion a year to the American economy. Um, indeed, over 72% of international students in the United States say that their primary source of funds is foreign, uh, that could be personal, family, government, or some kind of private sponsor. Uh, consider also that American institutions uh, are opening campuses overseas, uh, thus coming into contact with international students who are not included in the numbers that I have mentioned. Uh, distance learning is also allowing students to participate remotely, and MOOCs are a, a whole new frontier in international education. Uh, therefore, the significance of international students is only going to increase, and therefore the services that we provide for them should increase too. International students are different from the typical American student in several ways. Uh, the most obvious is language ability. Many, although not all, of course, international students speak English as a second language, with varying degrees of fluency. There are also domestic students who face English language challenges uh, too, of course, and in this sense I mean students whose secondary education occurred at least partly in the United States. And so at least in theory, these students should have been introduced to aspects of information literacy as part of the curriculum at their American high schools. Um, that said, immigration status is, is 
of no importance to us as instructional librarians or, or faculty. Uh, and domestic students who want to or who could benefit from participating in library instruction programs that are targeted at international students should be welcomed. Language abilities of international students vary from student to student, and even a student with excellent reading and writing skills may find conversation um, and lecture or conversation tend to be the dominant uh, modes of in-person information literacy instruction. That conversation may be very intimidating, um, this as described by Morris and Given in their study of Chinese graduate students in Canada. Another aspect of studying in a second or foreign language is the relatively limited vocabulary that many students have. Uh, this is particularly st significant for students who, because of limited information literacy skills, depend on full text keyword searching as their primary search strategy. Uh, the literature reports that students have developed some uh, effective coping strategies, such as uh, using the thesaurus function of Microsoft Word, or the spelling suggestion feature of Google Search to expand or correct a list of search terms. Uh, but it would be better to introduce the concepts of controlled vocabularies and subject headings to international students. This is the first instance of a theme that we're going to see several times here. The typical American student also needs instruction about controlled vocabularies and subject headings if he's going to move beyond the world of keyword searching. Um, and so improving the way that we support international students will improve the way that we support all students. A question sometimes posed about international students is, is native language instruction or bilingual instruction a wise policy goal? Now, that prompts two more questions. Is native language instruction feasible? And is it even necessary? <coughs> In some cases, a university might be able to provide native language or bilingual information literacy instruction. Librarians, especially humanities or area studies liaison librarians, might have the relevant language skills. However, they also have existing responsibilities, and it's not clear what information literacy instruction for, say, Brazilian engineering students would be more effective if they are being taught by a liaison librarian with reading knowledge of Portuguese and familiarity with Latin American and Iberian literature. Uh, consider, too, that while uh, Mandarin-speaking students from China and Taiwan uh, made up more than 30% of international students in the United States last year, there's a long tail of mother tongues. Uh, only four countries of origin, China, India, South Korea, and Saudi Arabia, send more than 5% each of the total number of international students. Um, even considering that students from several sending countries can speak the same language, for example, Mexico, Colombia, Venezuela, and Spain together account for just under 4% of the total number of international students. Um, still, it would be very difficult for universities to provide native language instruction for all international students. But even if it were possible to provide native language instruction to everyone, it might not be necessary. Uh, consider that international students have usually achieved high or at least acceptable scores on language exams like the TOEFL or the IELTS before being accepted. They may not have native level fluency, but they can be expected to have basic proficiency. The accommodation that international students need in terms of language is not, in my opinion, instruction provided in their native tongue, but rather instruction provided in English by librarians who have been trained to work with students who speak English perhaps less than fluently. Some really basic pedagogical awareness that English language learners will benefit from a slower pace, from more repetition of key vocabulary, from more encouragement to ask questions. These <coughs> strategies would improve the effectiveness of English language instruction for international students. What's more, learning and practicing these same pedagogical strategies will improve outcomes for students whose native language is English, too. 
Of course, there may be some cases where institutional factors, such as the significant size of one linguistic community or the availability of bilingual librarians, make it possible to provide native language instruction. However, that does not need to be considered the gold standard. Another way that international students differ from the typical American student is culture. International students are not starting from a blank slate waiting to be filled with knowledge from the American style of education. They're the product of years or sometimes decades of education and training in other countries. The structure of educational institutions and in particular libraries varies greatly around the world. International students may be surprised by the existence of open stacks and circulating collections. They may be discomfited by the expectation that they identify and refine their own research questions. Uh, they might be unaware of the definition of plagiarism and the negative consequences that it will provoke. The ability and willingness of librarians to assist in research, that's not universal. In some academic traditions, the librarian functions more as a, a guardian of books than as a facilitator of research. Similarly, the role of the student in the United States may require more self-direction and creativity than the role of students in some other cultures, where recall is more important than research. Adult students have developed mental models of educational uh, institutions based on their past experience. And if there are significant differences between their previous institutions and their current American one, uh, explicit instruction and explanation of those differences is necessary in order for students to build new, more accurate mental models. Um, so, because international students have these special needs, we have to develop inter information literacy programs that are targeted to them, remembering, of course, that international students are not homogenous, even from particular sending countries. Um, now, the way forward, this is a continuing research project for me. I, I hope to continue this research with some surveys and focus groups and perhaps even a targeted information literacy program. Uh, but you guys will also have the opportunity in your roles as librarians or instructors to consider the same issues and serve this population. Um, so I wish you the best of luck, <laughs> and if you have any uh, bright ideas or questions, I'd love to talk to you during our, our Q&A or after the session is over. Thank you.